So if you know anybody who's been accustomed to his writings or whatever, and has read his writings, uh, C.S. Lewis is and has been influenced by him, because we're not done yet. This is going to finish up the influence of C.S. Lewis and uh, the bewitching influence of C.S. Lewis, which uh, <clears throat> I think will shock some people, some of the influences that he had. But reading his writings, maybe, how, maybe a lot of it won't shock you <laughs> when you've read what, what we went over already. But his theology has impacted many people has had an impact on many people. And we're going to talk about that right now. Why do, so the question, I guess, is we, we're going to pick this up, and Brother Aaron's going to put this all in one file on Sermon Audio, uh, right, Brother Aaron, these two files here. But um, to pick this right back up here, the first, why, David Cloud asks a good question. The question he asks is, why do new evangelicals love C.S. Lewis? You know, why do they? And he started to look at that and figure out, well, why do they, why do they love him so much? You know, I mean, what's the deal? Because most like guys like us, we really wouldn't like him that much. I mean, just, just off the cuff, we wouldn't. Uh, remember, the Bible says this. It says, In no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. All right. So, first, so David Cloud asked that question, why do they? And he says this. He says, They are characterized by a pride of intellect. And I believe that's true. And Lewis was definitely an intellectual. If you understand his writings, like his theological writings, he was an intellectual. Now those, I'll be honest with you, most of those guys bore me to death. I, I get bored with them and I can't listen to them anyway or read after them because they're so boring you don't get anything out of it. But you take men that were highly educated among themselves like Charles Spurgeon, or those guys, and I can read their writings. I can read guys like Jonathan Edwards and 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 those kind of men. But and uh, John Bunyan, right? John Bunyan and men like that. But when it comes to men like the intellectualized, it appeals to the flesh. It appeals to the intellect. Now, uh, this is interesting because David Cloud doesn't make this comparison, but but I will make this comparison with you and say this: that that is the Lucifer. That is what he does. Okay, Lucifer appeals to the intellect, to the knowledge, because they are always seeking after what? Light. To the entrance of the Masonic Lodge, they ask you what? When they enter into it, they ask him what question? What are you here for? For light. That's what they ask him, and that's what they tell him. That's their response. That is their pre recorded response, their predetermined response. They tell him, What are you here for to get from the worshipful master? light. So that's what he appealed to was intellect and light because that's what they want, this light. He had almost a photographic memory and had a triple first at Oxford in philosophy, classics, and English. He was one of the greatest experts of the day in English literature and occupied the first chair in medieval and Renaissance literature at Cambridge University. Since, <clears throat> since new evangelicals almost worship intellectualism, which is true, you're going to see that by Piper when we talk about him, uh, intellectualism, a spirit that the late David Otis Fuller called scholar -olatry. I like David Otis Fuller. He wrote a good book, didn't he? A couple of them. But uh, if you ever heard of him, go look his books up. He's got some, he had some good books out there. Uh, but, but he called it scholar -olatry. What is that like idolatry for scholarly? Scholarly, it's this, this thirst for this light or knowledge or intellectualism. It is no surprise that they would look upon the famous intellectual C.S. Lewis as a patron saint. Second, new evangelicals love C.S. Lewis because of his ecumenical thinking and his refusal to practice separation. You ever notice this? I mean, he had no separation at all from, from false doctrine, from, from uh, Catholics, from anybody, they just embr he embraced all of them. What is that? That's Antichrist religion, to embrace all those things. Uh, he says this, This has been admitted by Christianity today. Lewis's concentration on the main doctrines of the church coincided with evangelical concern to avoid ecclesiastical separatism. Therefore, he, Lewis admits is, is popular among evangelicals today because, like them, he despised biblical separation. They despise it. He despises it. You know, there's this goal to bring everybody together, to make everybody one. 
You want to bring them all together, all together, and make everybody one. C.S. Lewis was, in fact, very ecumenical. The following is an overview of his ecumenical philosophy and his influence on present-day ecumenical movement. Lewis was firmly ecumenical, though he distanced himself from outright liberalism. He was very crafty the way that he did it. In his preface to Mere Christianity, Lewis states that his aim is to present an agreed or common or central or mere Christianity. There's no such thing. There are only biblical absolutes. There is no such thing as just this generic Christianity that people try to push. It's not real. It's phony. It's fake. So he aims to concentrate on the doctrines that he believes are common to all forms of Christianity, including Roman Catholicism. It is no surprise that he submitted part of his books to four clergymen for criticism. Hey, look who he left out, Brother Paul. An Anglican, a Methodist, and a Presbyterian, and a Roman Catholic. the Baptist out. So Piper took care of it for him and went ahead and added his two cents in a little bit later. What's that, Brother Paul? No, we don't even exist. All oh, those, those, those seditious people. The, yeah. He hopes that the book will make it clear why all Christians ought to be reunited, but warns that it should not be seen as an alternative to the creeds of existing denominations. He likens the mere Christianity he describes in the book to a hall from which various rooms lead off. These rooms are the various Christian traditions, and just as when you enter a house, you do not stay in the hall, but enter a room. So when you become a Christian, you should join a particular Christian tradition. See, there's no Bible. It's a tradition to him. There's, there's no Bible faith. There's no church. It's just tradition to him. Lewis but is not too important which room you enter. So, it will be right for some to enter the door marked Roman Catholicism, as it will for others to enter other doors. Whichever room you enter, says Lewis, the important thing is that you be convinced that it is the right one for you. Does anybody know what that's called? Re yeah, pragmatism and relativism. Whichever truth is relative to you. Listen, I want you to, I want you to think about this for a second. Because some of you have fell for this mindset. And you better get it out of your head and ask God to forgive you for it because it's wicked. Well, that, that's true for you, but that's not true for me. That's, that part's true for you. That may be evil for you, but that's not what I, what I believe. That might, that might be evil for you, but it's not evil for me. That's not what I got out of that. No, no, no. They're absolutely right, and there's absolutely wrong. And if you live anywhere in between, you are in sin. Plain and simple. You don't get to choose what you don't get to choose uh, your your own relativity. It is absolutes found in the scripture. If something is evil and wrong, it's evil and wrong to everyone, not just some people. It's not an opinion. Sin is not an opinion. Sin is the breaking of God's righteous law. It is transgressing God. And if you can tell me that Hollywood and wicked movies and films and entertainment of that sort is not transgressing God's righteous law, well, you better check and make sure you have the same God of the Bible then. Because it's not relative to you and to me. It's not wrong for some people to listen to cussing and for other people to accept it. It's not wrong for some people. No, it is always wrong. It is always sin. You don't get to have those. That's you, What you're pushing is a C.S. Lewis theology. You are saying that whatever door you go through, does, it sounds kind of like me asking Brother John the other day, like we talked about last week, Brother John, how do I get back to my car in downtown Minneapolis? Oh, just be sincere, brother. You'll find your way home. You'll find your way back to the car. Paul didn't understand that C.S. Lewis theology. We had to explain it to him last week. For a month, he's been tormented by that. But we, he's got it now. That's right. He's got it now. No, you're, you're talking New Age relativity when you act like that. You are saying that you are the authority on what's right and wrong and not the Bible is the authority. If the Bible says to uh, 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 abstain from all appearance of evil and, and set no unclean thing before mine eyes or no wicked thing before mine eyes, if the Bible says that, no, that's absolute. That's, just, that's not an opinion. 
That, that's, that, that, but C.S. Lewis says, it doesn't matter, whatever door you go through. Whichever room you enter, says Lewis, the important thing is that you be convinced that it's, right, it's the right one for you. And he says, when you have reached your own room, be kind to those who have chosen different doors. Um, now, does that not sound like Billy Graham? Billy Graham's son is saying that Mormonism is not... That's not nice to call them. I'm not doing the invitation for you. Brother Aaron's looking for it. He's like, you gotta... I'm looking for, I'm looking for the Billy Graham. You're not getting it, brother. There's only one time. We'll sell that tape for $5.99. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you, you don't... You, Billy Graham taught the same thing. Oh, it's not nice. Be nice to other people in the same rooms. In the same, we're all in the same house. It's just a different room. No, we're not. We ain't even on the same block. Now, in comes another man, John Piper. Now, John Piper was the former pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church. And that, that church is located in downtown Minneapolis. Yep, correct, downtown Minneapolis. And um, well, he says that he says that uh, Lewis had some foibles, he calls them. They're just, he calls them foibles. Is there anything like the trouble with trebles? I don't know. Anyway, he said he said he had he had he, has, he just has some foibles. Nothing major, just a few foibles. Um, no, these were made. Lewis was a heretic, and listen to what he, what 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 Piper says about it. He said he doesn't believe in the er inerrancy of Scripture and defaults to logical arguments more naturally than to biblical exegesis. He doesn't treat the Reformation with respect, but thinks it could have been avoided and calls aspects of it pharisaical. Well, then why do you like him? <laughs> <clears throat> He steadfastly refused in public or in letters to explain why he was not a Roman Catholic, but remained in the Church of England. He makes room for at least some people to be saved through imperfect representations of Christ in other religions. This is Piper admitting this. He made a strong, logical, but I think unbiblical case for free will to explain why there is suffering in the world. He speaks of the atonement with reverence, but puts little significance on any of the explanations of how it actually saved sinners. So what he's basically saying is, is that he's a heretic without calling him one. Piper, but Piper loved him so much after all the... Now, Brother Paul, would you like somebody that told you the scriptures were, were, weren't perfect or that there was error in the scriptures? Would you being a preacher of the scriptures, the, a preacher, a pastor, a, a man that has been called of God, supposedly, and he, was, and he was supposed to follow this book, and this was his authority, and would you recommend a book of somebody that said, well, the Scriptures, they have error. And Jesus Christ, he didn't, he didn't understand some things. He, he show, Jesus Christ showed his own ignorance. That's what, that's what C.S. Lewis said. Now, let me ask you, would you want to recommend to people to the tune of millions of people, that book. Now listen to what Piper says. Piper, in his introduction to the book Alive to Wonder, celebrating the influence of C.S. Lewis. Piper writes, I put, we ought to preach in front of that place. <laughs> Piper, Piper writes, I put, I put Lewis in the top three writers who have influenced how I read and respond to the world. Yes, the world is a book to be read, and few people could read like C.S. Like Lewis. So in spite of all Lewis's flaws, the most fundamental reason why he has been so influential in my life and so awakening to my own soul is that he remained anchored as a Christian in the unfathomable rock, solid objectivity of God and his truth, and his gospel is infinitely beautiful and infinitely desirable, and therefore as the unshakable ground of unutterable and exalted joy. Yeah, how do you get any of that out of what he said? You, you tell the guy, first of all, if you tell him he doesn't believe the Bible is without error, he believes it has errors in it. He, did, he, he had a backwards view of the atonement. All of these other things. And then you're going to write a book about him praising him and recommending his books. Yeah, money, that's right. Because he knows if you put anything on C.S. Lewis, it's going to skyrocket. 
Anything with his name on it. Top 10 theologian book. One way to appreciate C.S. This is from a book called The Top 10 Theologians. All right. One way to appreciate C.S. Lewis is to see how his Christian humility shaped his life and work. In comes a man, Owen Barfield, one of Lewis's closest friends, said that the new voice with which he spoke after his conversion had an unmistakable note of magisterial humility. He was intellectually arrogant. He did not have it, it, he did not view Christ the way the scriptures do. Anyway, in comes this next group that you need to know about, and it's called the Inklings. C.S. Lewis and the Inklings. Now, these, were, these were some famous guys, but there's something about these guys and the groups that they were a part of and who influenced C.S. Lewis and who he influenced at the same time. Let's look at some of his friends, because you can always tell who somebody is by their friends, who they're comfortable with, who they hang around. C.S. Lewis also had a close friend named Owen Barfield. He dedicated the Narnia books to him and named Lucy after Barfield's daughter. Barfield was a philosopher who started out with theosophy. Anybody know what theosophy is? Alice Bailey, theosophy. According to theosophy, the God of the Bible is a tyrant and Lucifer the devil came to rescue mankind from him. Even this dark view of God shows up in C.S. Lewis's writings. After, listen to this. After his wife, Joy, died, Lewis wrote A Grief Observed, a book describing his thoughts and emotional struggles as a result of her death. The dark theosophical view of God shows up in his book as shown in the following quotations. Supposing the truth were God, always vivisex, is it rational to believe in a bad God? Anyway, in a God so bad as all that, the cosmic sadist, the spiteful imbecile. End quote. Lewis's friend Williams. These guys are all, was all, were all part of the Inklings. Williams would remain in Oxford, continuing to work for the press, but also giving occasional lecture series for the university, and of course, meeting with the Inklings until his sudden and unexpected death in May of 1945. Lewis was devastated by the loss more than any of the other Inklings. Now, you listen to this guy is, who he called his dear friend. Listen to this. Williams had effectively displayed, displaced Tolkien, which is another guy we're going to talk about sometime, Lord of the Rings Tolkien. From his place in Lewis's life, indeed, he called Williams in a letter written soon after the man's death, my dearest friend. So this was his dearest friend, Williams. Excerpt from the Inklings, C.S. Lewis, J.R. Tolkien. Charles Williams was this man's name. These were all the Inklings and their friends. Now listen to this. A fundamental element in Charles Williams' character, the thing that he was trying to express when he told a friend, at bottom, a darkness has always haunted me. What was this darkness that Williams, the friend of the, the dear friend of C.S. Lewis, was? He said by the time he was in his late 20s, he was making some study of the beliefs and practices of that semi-magical branch of Christianity known as Ros Rosicrucianism. An occult system using the blend of Egyptian and Christian symbols. During this period, he read books by the Rosicurian author A.E. Waite. He entered into correspondence with Waite and at Waite's invitation was initiated in 1917 into an organization called the Order of the Golden Dawn. Ever heard of the Order of the Golden Dawn? Well, you ever heard of Aleister Crowley? Oh, that guy. How does he always come up? Well, when you call yourself the great beast Satan, you're around a little bit in all this time period. You mean, wait a minute, C.S. Lewis, uh, the Inklings, uh, Crowley, Golden Dawn. See, some of you don't know who, who, uh, who uh, Al you guys know who Aleister Crowley is. Some folks don't know who Aleister Crowley is. He was a wicked man. He prided himself on being called the most wicked man that ever lived. He called himself the Beast 666. And he developed his own form of magic that I'll age appropriately call fornication magic. Spelled with a K. 
by the time he was in it, anyway, so in the Order of the Golden Dawn. Now, among its first initiates was into the Golden Dawn was a coroner. Remember, this is his friend Williams, part of the Golden Dawn. Okay. Among its first initiates was a coroner who allegedly performed necromantic rites. While another early member was black magician Alistair Crowley, the self-styled great beast. But the Order of the Golden Dawn also included persons of less outlandish ways, such as W.B. Yeats, whom Williams met during the period of his membership, one or two clergy with a taste for the mystical. And A.E. Wade himself, it was a group that Williams joined. Williams is a devout Anglican. How could you be a devout Anglican and be a part of all this stuff? I don't get that. I say this, and it's like saying a devout Baptist, and you're, and you're running around with, like, Jehovah's Witnesses or something. It, it doesn't make any sense. Williams a devout Anglican, as well as a former member of the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross. I mean, it just gets worse. Yeah, Rosicrucians, yep. And a specialist in Tarot and Kabbalah. Well, that, that explains the connection between all of them. Was a close friend of Tolkien during the years of the Second World War and an even closer friend, almost indeed, of spiritual advisor to C.S. Lewis. He is the last magician, both at the last of the magical creative inklings to receive due attention and as the last major writer to emerge, as Yeats did before him, from the Western occult tradition. Williams, this is, this is again C.S. Lewis's friend. Williams was an occultist trained in A.E. Waite's Fellowship of the Rosy Cross, an organization descended from Yeats' Order of the Golden Dawn. A lifelong Christian, he challenged the church's traditional aestheticism with a theolo theology of romantic love, urging a positive reassessment of, I will skip that word, and emphasizing coherence. Alongside his marriage, he maintained an agon agonizingly unconsummated 18-year love affair with Phyllis Jones and acquired a host of disciples, young women in particular, who depended on him for spiritual advice. He continued sometimes with their cooperation to practice magical rituals which he believed were essential to sustain his creativity. Potential audiences of the upcoming book included enthusiasts from the Arthurian legends, this is now quotes from the Inklings. Uh, those with an interest in spiritual matters in the occult and Christians, especially in the USA, where William's theology is on college reading lists and his novels have an occult following. So this man is popular everywhere today. A brilliant Anglican theologian, they say about him, Charles Williams, an interpreter of Christian doctrine. He was, trained, he was a trained occultist who continued to practice what can only be called magical rituals with a fornication and even sadistic tinge to them. I'm using that word sparingly, of course. His hermeneutic imagination. The effects of the golden dawn. Now, again, this is Williams. This is his dear friend Williams. You following? The effect of the golden dawn on fantasy literature at the Tolkien Sentinel Conference in 1992, Charles Williams stands out because of both his overtly theological uh, overture and because of his close connection with C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. So they're admitting the connection. He joined the Golden Dawn in 1917, was active for at least five years thereafter. He too was attached to Waits Group. Anyway, I, I, I'm not going to read everything I have on this guy, but needless to say... Um, Actually, that is. There can be no doubt that Williams's novels owed their themes to areas studied by the Golden Dawn. Shadows of ecstasy pulsates with the hermetic dictum as above, so is below. As is above, so is below. That, were their, that was their themes. The place of the lion, the platonic archetypes. We are confronted with the tarot deck and the greater trumps. Necromancy and All Hallows Eve and ghosts, witchcraft and damnation and descent into hell. These are the books that Williams wrote. This is C.S. Lewis's dear friend. Now listen to this. One may legitimately wonder what influence the Golden Dawn had on Lewis and Tolkien via Williams. Certainly that hideous strength, that's a horrible book, that's a hideous book by the way. Uh, the hideous strength is universally acknowledged to have been greatly affected by Lewis's acquaintance with Williams. Its description of the company of St. Anne's is certainly evocative of Williams's companions of the co 
from afar off. It carries, therefore, also the mark of the golden dawn. Everything they stood for, those writings are inside of those books. That's what people are reading. Come on, preacher. Nobody's really looking at those. No, only hundreds of millions. That's, that's it. It's not, it shouldn't be too big. You, you know, I bring all these things together for you. And I know, I, I, I understand that some of you believe in your heart that it doesn't matter. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something. We are seeing it through rock music, seeing it through false prophets, seeing it through literature, seeing it through Hollywood, seeing it through movies, seeing it through books that you read. It's an all-out occult invasion. And it's all centered. And if you and I are not careful, we will allow things into our lives without even knowing it, that it's even a part of it. And I wonder if you believe that's dishonoring to the Lord or if you believe it's okay. <clears throat> Tolkien was a cultural Catholic. This is C.S. Lewis's dear friend, too. Deeply read in both folklore and pre-Reformation literature. Yeah, they didn't like the Reformation. They wanted to go before that in the medieval times. These were themselves sufficed, albeit more or less unconsciously, with the magical and hermetic worldview. We don't want to get into the hermetic worldview. We don't have time. Of which, after all, the golden dawn was only one exponent. Lewis's strange friend, Barfield. Uh, we just talked about him a little bit. Uh, Owen Barfield dedicated the Narnia books to him, Theosophy. Uh, yeah, according to Theosophy, yeah, we talked about that. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to skim through some of this here and kind of get rid of some of this. Okay, here we go. Okay. In, his, in, in Lewis's uh, Surprise Joy autobiography, he lists Barfield as the second one of his friends. Um, okay, Barfield also taught something. This is, remember, this is one of his best friends. In keeping with the teaching of anthroposophy, Barfield espouses his belief in reincarnation on several occasions. Indeed, reincarnation is essential to his understanding of the evolution of consciousness. In Unancestral Voice, the Megat, a spirit, being in Barfield's book elucidates reincarnation for Bergian. It is only through repeated earth lives, he says, he explains that mind could gradually and as a historical process become more and more individualized. That is to say, could gradually emerge from the spirit which gave birth to it. He's talking about reincarnation. Anyway, so he goes on to explain reincarnation, what he was into. Um, Let's see here. Okay, here's another one that he says here. Here's another quote from him that he says here. Apart from his brother, Warney Lewis, C.S. Lewis's best friend was Owen Barfield. And from 1927, they went on three or four day walking tours together in the spring. His great contribution was to persuade C.S. Lewis and through Tolkien that myth and metaphor has always had a central place in our language and literature. When he was working in London, he occasionally joined the Inklings when he came to Oxford. So anyway, he convinced him that he should write like that. The writings of the Inklings, J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, Owen Barfield, and Dorothy Sayers are well known, especially in Christian circles. Here are a few references to J.R. Tolkien here. J.R. Tolkien wrote a personal, personally revealing essay on fairy stories. So Tolkien is the guy, the Lord of the Rings guy. We're not going to deal with him right now, but I just want to give you an understanding of where these guys were at. Who these guys now? They now. I'm not trying to paint the picture that these guys were best friends with with Aleister Crowley because they really weren't. See, Aleister Crowley went off into what would be considered a darker direction, okay? But that still puts it to the light, the the white magic and the dark magic, okay? And I want to tell you, really, what Tolkien and Lewis were to Aleister Crowley, they were dueling wizards. That's what they were. They were dueling wizards because they didn't really get along that well. And the Inklings, in fact, there's a comic book now that was written back in 2006. You should look at this, brother. There's a comic book that was written in 2006. And guess what it was about? It was about a war in the heavens. And it was about the Inklings versus Aleister Crowley. And Aleister Crowley was trying to basically pull off a sons of God, daughters of men scenario. And the Inklings were going to try to, with white magic, they were going to try to stop his black magic. So what happens to that? There are no absolute truths. All magic is not evil. Some magic is good. That's what's being taught there. 
See, people need to understand what you subject your children to and you allow them to see. If there are not absolutes in it, you set up a scenario in their mind to where not all evil is evil and it's good and there's some bad, you know, there's some good and bad. That's, that's what you're teaching them. Okay. Uh, J.R. Tolkien wrote a personal revealing essay on fairy stories embodying his theology, philosophy of fairy and sub-creation, as he called it. In addition to his magna opera, The Lord of the Rings, the, the Silmarillion, and his many story notebooks, which his son Christopher had been editing and publishing over the last decades. He has two short stories, and he features fairies and, you know, all that weird stuff. The best commentaries on Tolkien's work emphasizing his mystical and spiritual thought are by Verilyn Flieger of the University of Maryland. A Question of Time, J.R. Tolkien's Road to Fairy, Splintered Light, Logos and Language in Tolkien's World. Some of their, the people that wrote after them um, would, would really tell the truth about who these guys really are. Listen, this group, there's a connection from these inklings with the Golden Dawn. In fact, like two of the three were members of the Golden Dawn of these inklings. Uh, they were... They, they were in, in fellowship with, with this Charles Williams, there's an occultic, obvious, well, with C.S. Lewis's writings, you can see the occultic. J.R. Tolkien has the same thing. There's an occultic group there that has come together, and they all kind of mesh together. So let me ask you a question. If I've seen a man that was trying to lead people to Rome, okay, and I've seen a man that was trying to lead people to Rome, and I see a man that was trying to uh, push magic and teach people magic and teach them a magical way of doing things. If I've seen that, if I've seen a man that was placing mystical things into his writings, if, if, he, was, if he was talking about white magic and black magic and framing black, white magic as being good and black magic as being bad, and the fact that I was, and all of the innuendos that are in the writings, all of the things that are placed in there for that reason, and the confusing mess of his theology and what he believed, and you have men like John Piper that are saying that this guy was a good guy, that his writings were good, uh, that, that we should read his writings. Uh, what do you think about a man that the whole world loves? Right. Why? Why do, why do some witches read the books of Narnia? Why are they in Christian schools? Why are they in Christian homes when they give a, a fair light and a, and, a, and a good light on Christianity? Do you not think that this has caused the confusion of the, this is part of the problem and the confusion of the day? Why do you think that is? Why do you think when you and I look today and you have people that will tell you, oh, there's nothing wrong with C.S. Lewis? Well, he wrote books that said that white witchcraft was good. That white magic was good. Yeah, but that's just fantasy. No, it's not. Magic's real. Mm -hmm. You know, I was doing some studying. And I ran across a book in my studies. Because I was studying the word in the Bible, necromancy. So I just happened to do a word search on a few things. And do some studying. And I ran across a book. And Brother Paul, you ought to see this book. It was written by a good preacher. You know, I mean, he wouldn't agree with us 100% on everything, but he had some good things that he said. He was an old preacher. Has anybody ever heard of the book, The Saints' Everlasting Rest, by Richard Baxter? Richard Baxter was an old Protestant uh, from the 1600s. He wrote The Saints' Everlasting Rest. He wrote quite a few other books. He was around the time of, of uh, uh, let's see, King James. It was around the time of King James in England, and uh, he wrote a book. He wrote another book, though, because there was a lot of stuff going on at the time over in England, and jolly old England wasn't so jolly at the time. See, there was a lot of witchcraft going on, and this well-respected man wrote a book, and the book was on necromancy, and it was on the spiritism of the times and what was going on. And in that book... It was referenced by another book. But anyway, part of the stories in this book that this preacher... Now listen to me. This was not a preacher that was like uh, a Pentecostal. 
He was not a spooky guy. He wasn't into spiritism. He wasn't into any weird stuff. He was a common day Reformation theologian like a Jonathan Edwards. That's the kind of guy he was, okay? So he wasn't a guy that was like, you know, uh, out there space cadet type guy. And he says, I got to write this book and I got to write it for a few reasons. He said, number one, I got to write it because God's people don't believe there's a spirit world. They just don't believe there's anything going on out there. You know, he tells in this book that referenced his book, he tells a story. And basically, back to his reasons real quick. I'll, I'll get to that. Some of his reasons, they don't believe it's real. And he said, I'm afraid that the devil, we are ignorant of his devices and the devil is winning this because people don't realize they're hooked into the occult and all this stuff. And, and they might be, they might, they, they're not wise as serpents. They're not paying attention to what's going on. And they're being sucked into this stuff and they don't believe it's real. And they're not praying against it. They don't even know who they're fighting against. They don't have a clue what's going on. They're clueless to it. So he said, I got to write this book. He gave like 12 good reasons. I'm like, man, them are good reasons. And I mean, he just, every point, just boom, he just nails it. He said, they, but anyway, and this is going to sound crazy to you, but I, I don't know why this well-respected preacher and these people would really lie about this. Well, he said that Richard Baxter, Richard Baxter told a story in one of these of things that were going on, because you have to understand England was a really spooky place. I mean, it's, it is now, but the spiritual manifestations. My friend Lewis over there told me stories about England right now. He says, man, that place is spooky. He goes, he goes, pastor, he goes, you don't understand what it's like here. He said, it's, there's this weird stuff going on. It always has, it's been like that a lot over there uh, for a long time. Well, anyway, he told about, <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, I know, but these guys told stories in this book and he listed documented evidence of things that have taken place. And he said there was there was a wizard, a man that was a wizard. That he said that he that that he and he invited this guy back to his house. So he went back to his house. And I, again, I know you're not going to believe what I'm saying to you, and I can't validate it because I wasn't there. Okay, but he tells the story of this guy that this guy had a circle in his living room, and he and he and he and he brought up a tree in his living room. It manifested. He grew up a tree in his living room through witchcraft. He was a wizard. And he straight up, and it grew there. And this man tells a story that three little men came out with axes and chopped that tree down in his living room. Three little beings came out, chopped it down. So one of the guys that was a farmer that was there took some of the wood scrapings and stuck it in his pocket. Okay? So he tells of the story of this guy taking these. He took a, what, what? What would those wood scrapings be? Anybody have an idea? What does the Bible call that? No, bark. Yeah, what calls it bark? That's, good answer. Good answer. I feel like I'm on Family Feud. Good answer. What's that? But you're wrong. <laughs> but you're wrong. That was a good answer. What would? Do you know what that'd be called, Anthony? If somebody took something like that, what was it called when Aiken did it? What did he take? The cursed object. He took of the accursed thing. It was a cursed, enchanted object, and he took it. He said that man tells the story of him going home, and that night he said that his house, there was a storm. <laughs> hey, listen, again, I can't validate it. I wasn't there. It's 400 years ago, okay? But he tells a story that when he took that home, he said there was a storm over his house, and it was blowing the house down. And his wife asked him, where have you been? Have you been at the, that wizard so-and-so's house today? And he said, yeah. And he, goes, and he goes, yeah, and I took these wood chips from it. And she told him to go burn the wood chips and get them out of the house because it's cursed. And you're, you're playing around with witchcraft. Now, whether you believe that or not, you don't have to. And I can't validate it. But I can tell you something. The devil has power. And if you look at what he did to Job... If you think that's just one isolated incident, or could that be possibly God trying to explain to us, showing us in his word what the devil is capable of and that dark kingdom is capable of?
Could it be? Is that why magicians, wizards, and many other people discount the historicity? And C.S. Lewis said the book of Job was just Jewish fables. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to see the judgment upon those things and to show the power of God there and what God was really doing and what he was like. My point is this. If those are accursed things and things like that can happen, what do you think the writings of these men are that are lifted up and read and allowed to be read? What do you think, what impact do you think these things have on children? What does it have when you see Christian schools today, like we talked about before, when you see Christian schools that are, that, are, that, are, that are promoting the book, The Circle Maker, which he got from a witch? Calling it Christian? And it's promoted in schools? And the books of C.S. Lewis with witchcraft in them, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe are just handed out to kids? I mean, the first clue would have been the witch thing for me. That would have been like, oh, maybe that's a good idea. The second clue would have been when I read it, and they said, there's good magic and bad magic. There's white magic and black magic. That would have been an indication that that guy's into some weird stuff. Because no Christian makes magic look good. No. See, we have blurred the lines and everything is so that people are trafficking in these accursed things, and they have no idea. God's people are trafficking in these accursed things. They are messing around with these devilish things. It's just like the music and everything else. When you bring in wicked rock and roll music, the voodoo beats and everything else with it, you are inviting devils into your home. You're inviting them into your mind. You are inviting them in and you are listening and being entertained by them. I'm going to preach a sermon in the future called Spirit, The Spirits in Lyrics. And I'm going to tell you something. You can listen to their words, what they're saying to you. And they are, they are basically tell, they are telling you that they're involved with devils. They are telling you that. I had somebody say, they don't really believe those things, though. Well, then why do they get power from them? And why do they ask for popularity through them? See, when you play around with the devil's stuff. Now, let me ask you a question. Some of these big Baptist churches, and I'm picking on Baptists because I really, I'm not worried about everybody else, okay? I'm a Baptist, okay? I'm a Christian, but I'm a born-again Baptist. I'm saved, and I, and I pastor a Baptist church, amen? I'm not worried about everybody else. I'm talking about the ones that always say they're right, amen? Come on, right? They're the ones that always say they're right, aren't they? Okay, well, fine. Somebody's going to call you on it then. You be right then. If you're going to say you're going to be right, you be right. What sense is it to spend like 1500 bucks to fly a preacher in, to travel them around the country, to RV them in, to hand out tracks, to get the buses rolling, to bring all these people in for a revival meeting? Revival meeting. I can't stand it. It drives me nuts. I'm so sick and tired of it, man. I'm telling you, I can't, I can't stand it. It just drives because it's so phony. I'm so sick and tired of the phoniness of it. And they have this pre-planned revival meeting. And they, they plan this meeting, and they get all this stuff going, and then nobody ever talks about anything specifically. <laughs> right? They get them all jumped up and hyped up, and, man, they'll be, they'll be doing jumping jacks and cartwheels down there. They'll be doing the, the, the uh, what's that, what's one, one guy told me he was doing? Oh, man, oh, man there's that one video of the guy jumping in the baptistry. Woo-hoo! He's doing the worm in the baptistry. I'm like, what's going on here? What's? And I'm standing in the corner and I'm looking at this and I'm like, or I'm watching on. I'm like, well, okay, I'm waiting for here's something to make me get excited over. And I don't hear any preaching against sin. I don't any hear any call to holiness. I hear generalities. I hear I don't hear any specifics. So then everybody goes home and what do they do? They pop in their DVD player and they watch their wicked music. They listen to their or they watch their wicked programs. They listen to their wicked music. They practice their same old wicked things, reading their same old wicked books, and living their same old wicked life. 
but we do it around again a year and have another year. We have a revival meeting. We bring all these people in. They get these southern guys out of long accents, and they preach real hard, and they get everybody all hooked up and hyped up, and what happens? Nothing. You want to know why? Because they're trafficking in the accursed things constantly. That's why. And you get no power from God. <laughs> because nobody wants to shine a light into the darkness. They don't want to talk about it. Why? Because you're faced with a decision. And I'm going to tell you what, whether you want to lie about it or not, you are faced with a decision. You will either choose to live for God or you will make excuses for your wicked sin. And that's what you don't like. And that's what I don't like because we can't glorify our flesh in it. You know what all that hippity hop and jumping around stuff is? Nothing more than a glorified country rap concert is all it is. It's a bunch of garbage. They act like they're doing something real. Man, they'll be a shouting and doing jumping jacks and running through the aisles and everything else. But you know what? They're all holding on to their sin. Go out. You know what those same people do that preach all that stuff? Yell at me and get mad at me to my face when I reprove them for their sin on there. And they'll go and they're traveling around the country in RVs right now, preaching revivals everywhere while they're while they're fellowshipping and watching in witchcraft and reading their books and letting their kids read those books. And you, is God going to bless that, really? You want to know why this is so important and why I get so excited about it? Why I, get, why I poured in hours this week? Into this. Do you think I like pouring in hours about this stuff? No, I'd rather be the guy that hippity hops that everybody loves and gives a big, huge offering to. I'd rather be that guy. Yeah, I'd rather be the guy that everybody likes and is happy with, but I'm not. You know why? Because I have to tell the truth. That's why. And, and God revealed it to me. You know what? If I could just erase it sometimes, I'm telling you, I really would. I'm telling I'm bearing my soul here to you right now. I'm telling you the truth. If I could, I'd try to forget about it all sometime and say, forget about it because nobody cares. They just don't care when you try to give them the truth. They don't want to hear it. Why? Oh, I don't want to hear all that stuff. Well, I don't want to say all of it either, okay? And if I could do everything I want to do in this pulpit, do everything I want to do all the time, wouldn't life be great? Yeah, but we wouldn't have any power from God, and we wouldn't see people getting saved, and we wouldn't see lives being changed, and people burning their movies and burning their books and getting right with God. So when you tell me about all your relativity and all your practicality and everything else, I could care less. When you give me your criticism, I could care less. You know why? Because I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. And I can't go back. I've opened up my mouth to the Lord, and I, can't, I, just, I just can't turn around and go back and forget it all. And you know what? I want to leave you without an excuse. So you don't get to go home and say, nobody warned me about this. You don't get to go home and say, nobody, nobody warned me about Hollywood. Nobody warned me about these movies. Nobody warned me about the television. Nobody warned me about these things. I didn't know that was witchcraft. I didn't know those things. You won't be able to say that. Because I did warn you. And this is a very dangerous man that we talked about. And his influence is very dangerous. And he's full of darkness and wickedness in his writings. And they have spread everywhere. And the influence of, of C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien is absolutely astounding. Let me tell you something. When I first got saved, when I first got saved, I was down in Iowa and, and an assistant pastor, I will not mention his name, but an assistant pastor handed me a movie that he had just watched. He said, you need to watch this. You know what it was? Lord of the Rings. Yeah. He said, you, you watch this. And I, I walked up to some other street preacher. He was a, this guy, was a, he was a, well, he wasn't a street preacher. Another guy that, that ran a ministry there. And I said, hey, brother. I said, you know anything about this? He goes, that's witchcraft. Where'd you get that at? I said, that preacher told me to watch it. Now, can I ask you a question? Why do you get to call witchcraft fantasy? Upon what authority do you call witchcraft and magic fantasy? Upon what authority do you believe you're allowed to do that as a Christian? Why do you get to call what God calls witchcraft and magic and wicked and evil? Why do you get to call it fantasy? Why? Because C.S. Lewis and some fancy guys nicknamed it folklore or magic or, or, or I mean, uh, fantasy. Or, or, so you get to call it that too? Well, what about what God's definition of it is? What about what God, sa what about what God says it is? 
See, because God says it's witchcraft and you call it fantasy. So do I take you or do I take God's word for it? Which one do I take? Do I accept your version of it? No, that's so you can live in your sin. Because <laughs> witchcraft is witchcraft. You don't get to call it fantasy, okay? You don't get to call it fake. You don't get to call it fake when people summon up magic in movies. and they do. You don't get to call that fantasy. God says it's witchcraft. I know people that spend hours upon hours upon hours upon hours playing wicked video games with magic in them. And they don't realize those people are drawing circles and conjuring up spirits and doing all those things. Right in front of them on that screen, they're doing it all. But you, get, but you get to get away with it because you call it fantasy? How about what Jesus calls it? How about what the Bible calls it? Because the Bible calls it witchcraft. Maybe we ought to get back to calling it what the Bible does so we can have the power of God. Because how can you send a man to preach for you once a year? We don't do that here because I don't believe it's right. But uh, And preach this, this so-called revival meeting. Because some of them have these men come in so they, so they can preach on things that these pastors won't. But there isn't anything that I won't preach to you. I don't need to have, I've heard them called, oh, they're the shepherd dog of the, of the pastor and all this other weird stuff. No, they're not. That's nowhere in the Bible. It's just goofy. Who, who thought that one up? They're the sheepdog to keep everybody in line. Really? Because I thought the pastor was the one that God gave to give the rod to. To bring out the rod of correction when he had to. Amen? That's what the Bible says. So I'm, to, I'm, I'm commanded to feed the flock of God. I don't need some guy coming in, because I'm not afraid to say anything to you that God wants me to. And you have to understand that it doesn't matter to me if you like it or not. I don't, I, I've never cared about that, and I don't care whether you like it or not. Because I have to do what God called me to do. And it's not always fun, it's not always easy, but you know what, it's always right. And, and, and let me tell you this. If we don't get back to getting this stuff, if we don't get back to clear definitions of Scripture and stop letting heathens and heretics define our word for us, don't even, don't, don't even play that revival game, because that's all this is a game today. You know, be, before you can have a revival, some people got to die to self. I mean, we gotta, the Bible says we got to die to the things of this world. That, we're count, that we reckon the world dead to us and us to the world. And we, we're never going to see any of that revival until we, we, we call a spade a spade and say what it really is and stop playing games. There's too much of that going on, and it's destroying people's lives. And you'll never see the power of God with it. And churches never see it, though they pay for a revival every year. Because I watch it, it's on their calendar, faithful. It's amazing how God planned that revival for them every year on the same date. I, it's just amazing to me how that works. It's the same date every year that God planned a revival for them. Can I ask you a question? Why can't we have it every day? Amen. That's right. <laughs> Why can't we have it every day? Why can't we live it every day like that? To have the power of God upon us. Folks, you don't plan it, you live it. You don't plan it, you live it. If you want, if you want it, then you walk in the Spirit, because that's revival. And preaching on sin and open air preaching and things like that. The Bible's, you know what? Charles Spurgeon said it right when he said, There was no great revival or no great awakening until there was open air preaching first. It, it always preceded it. But you got too many professionals today. That ain't going to happen. Why? Well, because right now, none of you are storming the pulpit here. You might be mad at me, but none of you are storming the pulpit right now. And you're not going to start yelling at me and disagree with me, right? If we had that, we'd talk about it in private or something. We wouldn't do it in the assembly. Amen? We wouldn't do that like that in the assembly. Why? Because it's an ordered assembly. Amen? So we have respect. We, we handle it. We conduct ourselves correctly. But out on the street, it's not ordered. 
and those pastors couldn't possibly stand for their word to be questioned. After all, they've written books and they have doctorates and they're smart. That's right. It is. And the, the Bible says God used the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. That's what he chose. That's his method. And that's what we're going to do. But I'll tell you something right now. Judgment begins at the house of God. If you and I can't accept this and Christians can't accept this as the fact that, hey, listen, you've got to get these, burn these wicked books, get them out of your life, get these stupid movies out of your life and burn those things and get rid of them. If we can't accept that, how can we so hypocritically walk out in the world and preach to men that they must repent? Right. When you're holding on to idols and you're holding on to wickedness, it is. It is. Absolutely. So how can, it, how can we expect to have the power of God if we're going to hold on to these things? That's the importance of preaching on things like this. And that's the boring specifics and all the other things that have to go into it. I understand. Hey, like I said, I love yelling at you. I'd rather yell at you the whole time. It's a lot more fun. Amen. At least for me anyway. I don't know about for you, but I like it a lot. <laughs> Makes me smile. Amen. I enjoy it. That's right. Yeah. You get to, I mean, I get to yell at people all the way over in the Amazon. That's right. Amen. And our friends in Hawaii and, and uh, in England. And by the way, pray for them, brethren, in Hawaii. They need it. Amen. Uh, they're going through a lot right now. They're, they're serving the Lord there with drug addicts and dealers and all kinds of crazy things. So pray for them. And pray for Brother David Henry, too. Don't forget about him. He's over in England or over in Europe. He needs some prayer, too, for his ministry, what he's doing over there. But listen, folks, that's the importance of these things. Because how can we, the Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. Ah, if the righteous scarcely be saved, right? We got we, we to gotta get rid of this stuff. We don't need it. I don't know, maybe some of you don't have any of this stuff, but maybe you know people that do. And they'll be having, the, you know, these churches will have all those meetings and everything else, and they don't talk about any of these things. They don't cover any specifics. People, get, people complain about the 30-minute message that the revival preacher brings, and they'll go home and they'll be watching TV for two, two hours. We need the power of God. God help us. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, thank you for the command to try the spirits. Help us to try the spirits. Help us to walk in spirit and in truth. Lord, there's dangerous men out there, and you said that they would be out there. You said that they would enter into the flock, not sparing the flock. And of our own selves would arise perverse men, men speaking perverse things. And dear God, they've drawn away many of them to Rome. They've drawn away many of them to an ecumenical movement, Lord, that's not of you. And Lord, I just pray if there's anyone that has been bewitched by these men, Lord, and by C.S. Lewis and his writings and other things, Lord, if they've been bewitched by them and the influences that that man had and his mentors and everything else. And Lord, I pray that these sermons would fall into their hands and they would listen to them, Lord. And they would hear the truth in them and they would be delivered from them. Oh, dear God, even one person this week wrote and said that they, were, they understood the truth of it and they saw it for the first time in their life. And Lord, we thank you for that, and we just pray that others, even our family members, Lord, that we would have an answer to give to them that ask us. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.